Thank you, Keith. The, the people we work with at U.S. Trust, like many people in this room, have started or run businesses, achieved excellence in a demanding field, attained wealth and reached most of the milestones that, the, that society traditionally sets for success. Yet one thing we hear from very successful people is that what matters to them most is their legacy. And by legacy, they mean something well beyond wealth, beyond any individual accomplishment. They tell us what matters to them most is passing along a sense of values that they hold dear, values for which they'd like to be remembered, and that they want to see handed down to subsequent generations. They talk about having an a positive impact on the causes that they care about, fulfilling goals of great personal importance, making their vision a reality, and putting goals into meaningful action. This evening, we're privileged to be able to consider the idea of legacy with an extraordinary panel of individuals. They have achieved a level of excellence in their own fields that has brought them international celebrity, respect, and renown. Perhaps even more remarkably, they've managed to make the crucial transition from greatness in their field to something much more, the pursuit of completeness as individuals. They've built and are continuing to build legacies that will define them for generations to come. We're going to talk a bit about what defines greatness on a playing field, on an ice rink, and on a mountainside, and how that compares with an enduring legacy as a human being. And now it's my pleasure to introduce each panelist. Jim Brown spent nine record-shattering years as a running back for the Cleveland Browns from 1957 to 1965. For his combination of power, speed, grace, and durability, the Sporting News in 2002 named him the greatest professional football player of all time. Among his many other feats on the field, Jim was the first running back to score 100 touchdowns and remains one of the few to hold that distinction. Made even more remarkable by the fact that he did this before the NFL expanded its current 16-game season and that he stopped playing at the age of 29. He's the only NFL rusher in history to average over 100 yards per game, and he reached the pre Pro Bowl in each of his nine seasons. And despite a constant pounding by defenses, he never missed a game. In 1965, Jim left football for a highly successful acting career, started starring in such films as The Dirty Dozen, Ice Station Zebra, 100 Rifles, and many others. In 1988, Jim founded American Program, dedicated to inspiring and improving the, the lives of young people. Michelle Kwan is the most decorated figure skater in United States history. For more than a decade, from 1995 to 2005, she dominated the sport like no other skater. Her unprecedented 43 titles include five world championships, eight consecutive and nine overall U.S. national championships, and two Olympic medals. In the nearly 100-year history of U.S. figure skating, no American man or woman has won more world titles, national titles, or Olympic medals. Off the ice, Michelle was appointed in 2006 as the first United States Public Diplomacy Envoy. In June of 2010, President Obama appointed her to his Council on Fitness, Sports, and Nutrition, and she's also a board member of Special Olympics. Last May, she received her master's degree from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University, majoring in international relations. David Brashers is a world-class adventurer and mountaineer and one of the most acclaimed adventure filmmakers. His work has taken him to remote locations throughout Tibet, China, Nepal, India, Pakistan, and East Africa. In the spring of 1996, he directed, photographed, and co-produced the first ever IMAX film on Mount, uh, on Mount Everest. During their filming on Everest, the mountain was engulfed in a deadly and infamous blizzard of 96. He and his team stopped filming to assist several of the stranded climbers to safety, 
including giving away their precious oxygen that they had stored for their own ascent. Later they regrouped and on May 23, 1996, he became the first to attain IMAX film images from the top of the world. David is the recipient of numerous awards for achievement in filmmaking, including four Emmys. He's also the founder of Glacier Works, a nonprofit organization dedicated to the tracking and documenting of receding Himalayan glaciers. Welcome, panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Michelle, let me start with you. You started skating very early. At what point did you become conscious of the fact that beyond the physical demands of your sport, others may see you as a role model? I started skating at five years old, and I watched Brian Boitano in 1988 win the Olympics. Uh, and then that was like the moment that I wanted to start dreaming of being at the Olympics. Uh, when I was about 15 years old, I'm 13 years old, I started competing at the world level, and then 14, 15, 15, I won my first world championships. And I remember uh, so vividly a mother coming up to me uh, and said, my daughter really looks up to you, uh, and she's not even in skating. And I, I thought to myself, like, that's a big sense of responsibility. At 15 years old, how do I, how should I act? What should I do? What should, can I do better? Can I, I and I, I felt that sense of responsi responsibility and I take it very seriously. Uh, and I understand that I'm gonna try to be the best skater that I can be. Uh, I'm gonna try to be the best daughter that I can be uh, and be the best sister, best friend I can be. So I make mistakes, but uh, just living, like being yourself um, and just trying to inspire others and motivate others to do their best. Great, no, that's great. Jim, every great, great legacy starts somewhere. We'd love to hear about some of the people who inspired you the most at an early age. Well, I appreciate you uh, starting there with me because uh, in high school, I had one of the greatest principals in the world, Dr. Collins, Raymond Collins. I had a coach that was the greatest man I'd ever met in my life. His name was Ed Walsh. And I had a Manhasset graduate who went to Syracuse, Judge Ken Malloy, who was a great uh, humanitarian. And the three of those individuals set the course for my life. Because first, they were all beautiful human beings. They advocated education over everything else, and they still had a love for sport. So I created a balance in my way of looking at things because Although most people wanted me to be just a football player, I wanted also to be a student. And uh, today, those three individuals stand uh, very tall in my life. I'm uh, 76 years old, but when I talk about them, I feel like I'm 14 or 15. Wow. And so I'm very happy to be able to say in front of this audience, uh, I thank you to the three of those particular individuals. Well, and I'm sure they thank you as well, Dick. David, sometimes negative influences can be as powerful as positives in creating determination to succeed. I understand you initially turned to climbing because you had some disappointments <clears throat> in some other sports you were sharing. Yeah, well, um, can I just have, say one thing? I'm totally awestruck sitting here. <laughs> next to well, that makes two of us. Uh, <laughs> and and uh, Michelle Kwan, and I grew up, you, you know, sitting on my daddy's lap and he's always wanted to watch the Cleveland Browns. And I said, one day I said, why dad, always the Cleveland Browns? And he said, because we got to watch Jim Brown run. <laughs> and and um, I was a boy, I watched the Dirty Dozen and you had to run down that road and throw those grenades there, in that yeah. thing. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they shot him. <laughs> they sent and he died and I cried. <laughs> and then Michelle Kwan, of course, I just have a sense of, I like watching figure skating because of the discipline. And, but I always thought of her in winning. Sure, she was a tremendous athlete, but she had such grace, poise, and dignity. Now back to me. <laughs> I, um, I, would, I, I was raised in Cheyenne, Wyoming. 
and I went to a pretty tough school. These were tough farmhands and cowboys, and um, I was a very slight build, uh, and basically I was hopeless at every single sport that was available to a young boy. Um, I couldn't wrestle with anyone because they'd tie me up like a pretzel and just throw me off the edge of the mat. Uh, I didn't want to get run over by a 180-pound, you know, eighth grader, middle linebacker. <laughs> they threw the ball at me in basketball, it just knocked me over. And probably Waterboy didn't qualify either. Just, I don't know. I had to find some way as a boy to find confidence in my, in some athletic endeavor. Because when you're young, it's, you don't get as much kudos as a boy for academic achievement as you do for competing. So climbing gave me the opportunity, this sort of sense of freedom of the hills where I could choose a companion. We were quite young. We didn't know what we were doing. But it, there was no one to compete against but yourself and your own idea of excellence and craft. And you had to choose a, someone who was uh, really on your side, someone you could trust when you were tied into the rope with them. So when we left and went out onto these rocks near Cheyenne, Wyoming, uh, I think I was drawn to that sense of freedom. I was also moving out of an arena, uh, which I had no place in, in competing with the other guys. Michelle, you mentioned uh, earlier Brian Boitano. Do you consider Brian a role model, and, and, and if so, are there others? Yeah, Brian Boitano uh, played a significant role in my, in my skating career, starting at 1988, the B Battle of Brian's, uh, seeing him win the gold medal. And at 12, 13 years old, getting the chance to meet Brian Boitano. Uh, and I was very, very fortunate to have a role model that turned into my mentor, uh, because at 14, I was on tour with Brian Wittano on Champions on Ice. And I remember him coming on the bus, and I'd be like, oh, Brian Wittano. I'm sitting, and, and I can't even say Brian without saying Boitano. So like, Brian Boitano. Uh, so I, I followed him everywhere, asked him questions about competing, and I, I admired the way he trained, uh, such discipline. Even to this day, he's doing the Boitano triple lutz with his arm over his head, uh, and just being able to go to yoga, go to the rink, and train twice a day, um, and keep that regimen for a long, long time. Uh, but as I tr transition out of figure skating into an another direction, I was at the University of Denver where I focused in international relations and political science. And then I was also appointed at that time uh, the first public diplomacy envoy by Secretary Rice. Uh, and then I followed the path of international relations. And throughout the last six years, I've had incredible mentors who have guided me um, either through the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, uh, and it's been um, extraordinary uh, since I feel like a new learning curve, where in the skating rink it was, I was very comfortable in my atmosphere, and here I was leaving the ice skating rink, everything that I know, um, and sort of abandoning it, abandoning it, and then going into this field where I'm surrounded by academics and people who are already working as diplomats and uh, professors who are teaching you about foreign policy, that an arena that you're unfamiliar with. But I've been lucky to have incredible mentors uh, like Professor Walkman, uh, like Secretary Rice, uh, that have been able to answer some of the questions that I have. and. Uh, I'm very appreciative of the role that they've played in, in my life. And okay. as Jim was saying, I, I know that the mentors that have um, been significant and played a significant role in my life will continue to play one uh, as I go, get older. <laughs> That's important. Uh, Jim, you left what most people would say your career at the prime of your career and, uh, and, and moved on. And, and I'm sure some said, gee, you left too early. You left at the peak of a career. And then you had great success in Hollywood. Is there something that told you when you were playing football, you know, it's time for me to move on to the next thing? It was really elementary. 
because I'd gone to one of the best high schools in the country. I had some of the best teachers and best coaches, a great superintendent. And I had a chance to visit places like West Point, uh, a lot of the prep schools, Deerfield, Mount Hermon, take trips in other parts of the country and see things. So, and also I was urged to run for uh, uh, chief justice of the student body and I had to speak in front of the, the uh, assembly. So I was fortunate enough to be rounded in high school because of the people that really were guiding me. And so I never put great emphasis in any one thing. So as a football player, I chose to make a living that way and I chose that to be my sport and I wanted to play it as hard as I could and I wanted to leave on time because I had examples of so many athletes that did not leave on time. They stayed too long as if that was the only thing that they could breathe. And I felt uh, I could do other things. I worked for Pepsi Cola for nine years while I played. And uh, I got an opportunity to do a film. So here's what I'll end up this by saying to you. I would say, I was thinking then that one day I'd be talking to you <laughs> <laughs> and you'd ask me this question. I had an answer for you. There you go. Well, sir, I retired at the age 29. The Cleveland Browns were world champions in 1964. And when I retired, I was MVP of the league. And then one of my first movies with Ra was with Raquel Welsh. And she was my love interest. <laughs> now, what the heck? <laughs> OK. You can't beat that. You know? Good answer. Uh, David, uh, talk to us a little about Glacier Works as you look at scaling mountains and you think about saving the glaciers. Um, this seems to be a passion for you and obviously part of, of what will be a legacy for you as well, I'm sure. Yeah, my life took a big turn, I think 2007. Um, I had spent 30 something years climbing uh, on Earth's highest peaks. I first went to Nepal for uh, a film. Uh, for some of you who may remember the American Sportsman series um, on, on ABC with Kurt Gowdy, they sent us off to climb this mountain and was, I'd already spent a, a long time developing skills as a rock and ice climber. And here was this long career, a lot of films, the Emmys you mentioned and the, uh, the IMAX film, and, I, and one gains a certain amount of, of influence with, in my case, a very small audience, but an audience that's watching in this region. And I started to see these changes when I was set out to do some research and, um, and to see what was happening to the glaciers that I've been climbing on for 30 something years. I was completely ignorant of the effects of climate change on the glaciers and uh, essentially the hydrology and the the health of many big rivers in Asia. So I really, I was happy with my career at that point, and it was more than a career, it was a life. It's what I did, climb mountains, took pictures. But I had to say, does this really amount to a hill of beans? Yeah. You know, right. what does it really mean? And I thought it means a bunch of films and people coming in and walking out the door. And, and I thought, um, what can I do to have a richer experience in my life that involves for, far less remuneration, far more more hard work? The, these ex, 10 expeditions for Glacier Works have been the hardest, but they're harder than, uh, I'd rather climb Everest five times than some of these individual trips. And so the rewards we're starting to get as an organization when we have an exhibit at MIT Museum, uh, a very hard museum to get into, uh, an exhibit that opened two months ago and has had 26,000 visitors, seeing a part of the world they haven't seen before, uh, learning about earth sciences and wanting to dig in and learn deeper about some of the problems we're going to face. Um, it it's, fits neatly in with all of my skills, I'm still happy out there at 26,000 feet. The colder and windier, the better. You know, and then, uh, these lights are really hot right now. <laughs> um, so I've, I can continue to use skills that 
um, people taught me along the way for, I think, something that I don't know what the outcome will be, but I feel we're starting off on some path that will eventually result in something worthwhile. And that will be part of a legacy. Michelle, you have a scholarship for women rewards. You've also written a book, The Winning Attitude, What It Takes to Be a Champion. And when I think of these, they all reflect on helping others achieve their dreams. Why is that important to you as a legacy? The last six years, uh, I've been able to finally put it together. Uh, when I was skating, I felt like everybody was focused on me. My parents, they made sure that I ate well, slept, took care of me. I was on time for the practices. I had my coach that I had his undivided attention for at least two hours a day. I had a trainer off the ice who focused one hour. What was I eating? Did this? Everything was focused so much on me. Uh, for my whole skating career. And we all were too. <laughs> that might interest you. <laughs> but I think about what I want to do, and I've, even throughout my skating career, I thought, well, what is it afterwards? What's life after skating? Because it's not like a career that you can do something for the rest of your life. Uh, so I always planned and prepared and prepared and prepared, but nothing prepared me for that sense of like identity crisis. Like, <gasps> I was so defined as a figure skater. I, I lived it, I breathed it, I woke up and I skated and I trained and I skated and eat and I trained and I trained and I trained. But then I thought, I enjoy giving back. I enjoy helping others, whether it's helping a little kid on the ice, whether it's uh, trying to motivate or trying to um, inspire a child or when they're upset, saying, you know, falling is okay. All, the but most important thing is you learn from mis mistakes and pick yourself back up. So I guess from, from finishing competing to now, I've realized, wow, I'm, I'm on a career path of public service. Yeah. Something, whether it's the scholarships um, when I was skating, I wanted to help kids, uh, I wanted to help uh, the age, age rate of 18 to 19 where they're student athletes uh, juggling being an athlete as well as you know, trying to uh, get a, an incredible education, um, whether it's being advisor for Women Lead um, in Ambassador Revere's office at the State Depo Department with women's issues, whether it's Special Olympics, uh, just being able to be a part of something that's bigger than yourself. And that's a wonderful legacy. Uh, Jim, the American program, uh, what are its aims and what do you hope to achieve in, in terms of helping others with that as a legacy of, of you? Well, American has been in existence since uh, 1988. Uh, you must remember I've always been an activist all of my life. So economic development in the 60s, the Black Economic Union, uh, working for Pepsi-Cola, trying to create job opportunities, et cetera. But what happened, the gang culture emerged in this country, street gangs, and particularly in the African-American community. And so young kids were killing each other over a red rag and a black rag, I mean, and a blue rag, Crips and Bloods. And I had a good reputation in my community because I never left the community. I never bought into being popular. I always went into what I call the east side of town and dealt with the regular people regardless of how big a star I was. And so I decided that I would find a way to stop some of this violence. And uh, I invited about 400 gang members to my home, different ones, and they accepted. And I had meetings there seven nights a, a, a week. The shot callers I wanted to seek out. And I found that because I invited them to my home, I treated them as I treated everybody else. They felt good about having an opportunity not to lose face and to be there and maybe work out some of their differences. And over 22 years, it's been amazing because for about 10 years in an area of murder every day, there were no murders. Uh, I have two young men right now that are the top shot callers in Los Angeles and they're working on a voter registration and voter education program. They brought it to me and I told them, you have now arrived because now I can marry you to this society 
and you can deal with my contemporaries and together we can make a difference in your community because we can get the right people elected who's going to look out for you. So I don't want to uh, over elaborate on it, but the bottom line is that my wife and I, each and every day, we work on stopping the violence and the education of young people in school. We have a curriculum in schools that bring grade point averages up, attendance up, disciplinary actions down, and we have summits that create a peace among gang members, even in prison. So that's... Uh, and, and, and that is the legacy. That's the boy. That is the legacy. David, you couldn't do what you do if you didn't stick to goals and not give up. Is that a legacy that you think you have and can pass on to inspire others to do the same? The whole concept is one of a legacy is kind of hard to get your head around, really. I mean, I still am only 56 years old. And um, I, I think that, I really think that to think about what a legacy is and wanting to have one is that Def, uh, is anti-legacy, if you, you know what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's sort of, everybody here that I'm hearing, they didn't set out to have a legacy, to be remembered for these things. So I just wanted to throw that out there, that um, to think of actively pursuing a legacy is very egocentric and self-referencing. But if one has to think about how they wish to be remembered for an example they set. I would think that being determined and, and, and persistent, those are easy things. Mm -hmm. uh, I think on a mountain, and what our team learned especially in 1996, is the idea of selflessness. And um, I mean, the people that I respect are people who make sacrifices that go against their own self-interest. Um, and uh, our team, some of them did that. I don't want to talk about uh, our team. I just wanted to think of what I would see as good qualities uh, in somebody else's legacy. That when someone stands out in the dark corner and no one ever is going to have the foggiest notion of anything they did, and they pursue something good for no recognition, for no money, for no kudos but for the benefit of other people, um, for me, that's a legacy. Thank you. I think what's important about thinking about legacy is we think about legacy as individuals, and we also should be thinking about it in, in terms of corporate America as well. And I want to say to all of you in, in, in working at U.S. Trust, we look at U.S. Trust and we look at the legacy of U.S. Trust being one that we don't really look at working with clients, we look at working with families. And we speak about clients in terms of their families. And we try and live that every day. We try to live that in the platform that we deliver. And uh, that's important to us as a corporate legacy. So I thank you each for what you have shared about not only the accomplishments, which are self-evident, but in terms of what you have done with those accomplishments, to some extent, each of you have almost taken them for granted as you've talked about what the next phase in your life meant. And that next phase in each of your lives, notwithstanding the individual accomplishments that you have that you're all known for, it's those next things that each of you have done in the rewards program in American and Glacier uh, that really is important. And whether you immediately see it as a legacy or not, I can tell you everyone in this room does. And with that, I'd like to open it up to questions in the room because I am certain that there, there must be some questions for, um, uh, for Michelle, Jim, and David. I think we have some microphones. Uh, please, if you have a question, raise your hand. And if you could, just, just tell us what your name is and, and, and ask the question and we'll take it from there. Questions? Over. Elliot. Hi, my name is David Billings. My question is for Jim Brown. Uh, I grew up, as an aside, being a New York Giant fan. And 
Well, Remember every right year <laughs> losing, <laughs> losing to the Browns with you running for touchdowns. But my question for you is, do you have an opinion or take a position on the lawsuit that 2,000 of your colleagues have filed against the NFL saying that the violence in the sport itself has caused health problems for them? Uh, yes, I'm glad you brought that up. Yes, I have a position, I have an opinion. I've worked very hard to be knowledgeable of these things. And let me just say to this audience, the two things that the NFL have neglected for the old players who were the pioneers of the game was health care for a lifetime, which they turned down when it was offered by the owners to the union. The union turned it down. So the health care only goes five years and it cuts off. And that's uh, uh, atrocious. The other is a dignified pension. The league makes billions of dollars and the pension plan is ridiculous. It is as bad as any major corporation in America. So there's nothing being done about those two things. But beyond that, uh, the league has always denied that certain injuries were football related. They had a saying that went like, this is not football related because these physicians that we brought in to say that said it. Because of the great work of certain writers for the New York Times and other individuals, uh, it has been proven that a lot of these things are football related. Scientifically, it has been proven. So now the floodgates have been open and the lawsuits are coming and it didn't have to be this way because the league could have reached out and they could have done the right thing in the beginning. And we don't know where it's gonna end, but it's gonna cause somebody a lot of money. And I'm for that 100%. And although I'm not a part of any of those lawsuits, I'm working with various organizations to uh, make things better for what I call our wounded warriors. So thank you for that question. Questions? We're back here. Trap Bonner out of New Orleans. I'm a former player, a human rights activist, filmmaker. I can't rollerblade, so a lot of respect for you, Michelle Kwan. <laughs> Jim Brown, you're such a great case study for how to not only for how to play the game, quote unquote, play the game. Um, I want to ask two questions. Why did you carry a briefcase to work every day while you were in the NFL? And why do you think um, hardly any other players follow your example? Well, let me say this. The Cleveland Browns were pretty much all college graduates. We operated in a discriminatory environment we had to deal with our educational background to deal with the contracts because we weren't allowed to have lawyers representing us. We had to think of our future. And it was my job as basically the leader of that outfit to make sure that we concentrated on the right things. So in those attache cases were papers that were very meaningful. And my number one guy, John Wooten, is a chairman of the Fritz Pollard Alliance, which is the one organization that's benefited from uh, Dan Rooney. They created the Rooney Rule, which has opened the door for a lot of black coaches, Tony Dungeon, all those individuals included. And the work basically goes on. So throughout my career, based on the educational background I had and the help that I had in Manhattan High School, I knew where to concentrate my efforts. Now, you had a second question? Yeah, why, why did you protect other athletes? Uh, oh, yes, why didn't they? Example. Well, you see, other athletes did follow. There is a historical picture of a meeting with Muhammad Ali in my office in Cleveland of the top black athletes in the country. We weren't trying to be discriminatory, but we were relegated black, so sometimes we had to act as a black unit. And that meeting <laughs> was Bill Russell, Kareem Abdul, Muhammad Ali, John Wooten, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 
And that particular uh, gathering was very inspirational, inspirational throughout all of these years because even young players now that see it want to have something similar so that they can call themselves to the forefront of things and make changes as a collective body. So that's basically your, your answer. They, and even now, Ray Lewis is one of my constant companions. And I chose Ray as the number one inspirational modern day football player. He's a tremendous humanitarian and a tremendous leader. And he and a few other modern players are joining forces so that we can get rid of the violence systematically and increase the education systematically. So the work goes on, but I'm glad you asked the question. Over here. Uh, John Walsh. Um, I'd like all three of the panelists to tell us, give us examples of legacies in or out of your orbit that you admire. Michelle? You got it. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Michelle. <laughs> I can start with one. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, I did bring up the idea of um, uh, making a sacrifice when, and you're acting against their own self-interest. And I remember um, a story of a, some sort of prosecutor, or um, I think he was a prosecutor in um, Colombia, and he had a wonderful wife and children, and yet um, every day he went out and he tried to prosecute and bring these uh, drug lords uh, to justice. And he knew how violent they were. He had written a note to his wife that he would probably not live for very many years. And he was shot and killed. And it's happened over and over again. And the idea that what happens to humanity when violence and threats from the negative part of our uh, nature can trump the selflessness and courage of something like that is something I ponder. And so that selflessness and courage and uh, in the face of what was certainly going to be the end he found um, is something that uh, really just uh, is very powerful for me. I'm going to pick someone that, in terms of legacy beyond sports, uh, that's made a difference in millions of people's lives, is Lance Armstrong. Um, he took something that was very personal um, and created a foundation that helped many people get through some the toughest moments of their lives. Uh, I know that there's a lot of controversy surrounding uh, Lance Armstrong and several drugs. This, and all that aside, it's like he's helped so many people in tough times when people are searching for answers and hope. Um, and I think when someone stands up uh, like Lance Armstrong that has <coughs> gone through it himself and has written books and has gone around the country, all over the world, talking about his personal experiences. I'm sure it's tough to do and tough to articulate at times, but um, it gives a, people a way to connect uh, to him and how he went through it and how he's uh, stood strong and was able to defeat um, and, and give hope to people. Okay. Well, Jim. thanks, Michelle. Uh, let me preface my choice by saying that America is the greatest country in the world. There's no doubt about it. But there's a lot of work that has to be done. There's a history that has made it impossible for a lot of us to participate fully in the economic life of America, or even just having quality of life. Uh, but it is a country that you can overcome. And they always have the exception to the rule who is that individual as a part of the ruling body that steps outside of that and reach out and, re and know you have a talent and risk all of the ill will of his compadres and say this is a, 
great person. I'm going to assist this person to be successful. Having said that, Dan Rooney of the Pittsburgh Steelers is that kind of man. The Rooney rule is a part of the NFL. And it says that in every time you have a head coaching job open, a coaching job open, you must at least interview a minority. And because of those interviews, a lot of coaches were found to be intelligent and desirable. And so you got the Tony Dungies and so forth and so on. And, uh, and I'm not going to bring politics up here, but he was also appointed as ambassador, ambassador to a country, I don't know, I forget the country now, by our present uh, president. And he accepted that. But he also let John Wooten, who was chairman of the, the uh, First Part Alliance, know that he would attend all of the annual meetings. So to me, Dan Rooney is truly a hero. And the risk factor becomes very important because a lot of people don't like to take risks. Right. They like to be popular and safe. Yeah. Good. Others? Yes, right here. Hi, Robin Kornhaber. Michelle, as a woman athlete, did you ever feel you experienced bias or discrimination? And how did you address it if you did? If you did? Thank you for that question. I, I was just going to add uh, one of my sheroes is Billie Jean King. And uh, this, is, this year marks the 40th anniversary of Title IX. And although I wasn't directly affected by Title IX because I didn't receive a scholarship, um, you always stand on shoulders who have come before you. And Billie Jean King was definitely uh, the hero that paved the way for women's sports. Uh, I personally never ran into any discrimination in, in figure skating. I, I was fortunate in, in some cases in skating uh, where I had people who paved the way for me in terms of uh, Asian skaters, Christy Yamaguchi, Midori Ito. Uh, so I never, I never did run into discrimination or hardships in sports. Thank you. Hi, Jean Fitzgerald, it's for Michelle. You started what became a career at an incredibly early age when most of us are still in a fog and trying to figure out you know, how, how to get dressed in the morning. And you obviously, you, you talked about having such a, a disciplined life that you grew up into. Were there, was there ever a time when you just said, you know, Mom, I don't want to do this anymore. I want to be a kid or I want to, I want to you know, stay up late at night and read my books under the covers? And if so, how did you deal with that? I think of sacrifices. Uh, and when I think of them, I think of my parents. Uh, I was the one that made choices uh, in my life. When I was 13, 14, 15, you know, all the way up to you know, 17, 18, I, I opted not to go and hang out with friends and uh, go to movies and have sleepovers. I made choices uh, and decisions that are hard for a teenager. Of course, I felt like I wish I was normal in some ways, but I think of my parents because they were the ones sacrificing for me uh, and for their kids because it wasn't their dream to be an Olympic ice skater, to skate one day, uh, skate over the rings, uh, and represent the United States. Uh, it was my dream. So I, I learned in a hard way, too, because when I was nine years old, I remember my dad saying, do you know how much we're paying for you know, a coach? 30, <laughs> and my, I don't come from a, a wealthy family. Uh, my, my parents, they worked over time either at a uh, Bank of America, sorry. <laughs> or my, my dad, had, um, he worked for Pac Bell and was also working at, at the Chinese restaurant that my family owned. Uh, so they were juggling really uh, in terms of paying for our lessons, paying for ice time, and it's times too because my sister skated well. So I learned in a hard way because he said, I'll give you $30 if you don't skate. And you're thinking, you know, nine years old, I'm like, how much candy I can buy, go to the movies. And th that's when I realized that my parents were making so many sacrifices for me to have the opportunity to skate. So he put it in terms of like, 
okay, well, you can play. Playing means that you also work hard, and you can mix the two. I think it's a good way to convince a nine-year-old. It's like, okay. And it w also taught me about money. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think that when I look back now, I'm like, that's a smart way to kind of psychologically teach your kids how to learn about hard work, how to be disciplined, how to have fun at the same time, and as well as learning about budgeting, about money. So I think, I think of not of sacrifices, but the choices I made when I was a kid. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, hi, my name is Greg Bangs. I'm directing this to uh, Jim Brown. Um, Jim, I was also a New York Giants fan, so I was used to seeing our team get pounded all the time. <laughs> but I'm directing it, I'm a Long Islander, and for folks who are not from Long Island, Jim Brown is not just a great football player, but to us, he's the greatest lacrosse player that ever played. And um, my question to you, when I was being brought up, folks were constantly referencing your work, you know, both in Long Island and going up to Syracuse. Lacrosse is probably one of the fastest growing sports in the country, as you're well aware. I'm interested in looking back, how do you, when you look back at your days playing lacrosse, what did you like about it vis-a-vis -vis football? Did you separate it? And now that you see this sport is growing, is there anything you'd like to impart to people overseeing its growth that you would like to see it achieve? Well, first of all, I'm a part owner of the Long Island Lizards. That's just, <laughs> <laughs> so that's the commercial. They're on a five-game winning streak. My wife and my family, my two, our two kids, and we're going to go back in a week to cheer them on. In fact, uh, I gave a pep talk at the start of that winning streak. And when I left the locker room, I was, I was so afraid that they would lose the game. <laughs> 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 but uh, I could relate, and I had a great time relating to uh, the players. When I went to uh, Clarendon Road High School, not, not junior high on Long Island, uh, there was a coach named Mr. Stranahan, and he was a lacrosse advocate, so he put a stick in my hand, and that's when it started. And I loved to learn the stick work, and there was great speed, and it was tough sport. You had to have stamina. You could hit the other guys, throw blocks, you know, hit them with your stick, all <laughs> kinds of things. So I continued to play it. And as you know, Long Island is a hotbed, and uh, Sawanica was uh, our chief rivals. And we were like a rich school. You know, I wasn't rich, and my parents were rich, but we, I went to it there, and it was very rich. I think the second rated high school in the country. And uh, man, I enjoyed it. And see, I played almost all the sports. I was a Catholic also. So I enjoyed sports. And at that time, there wasn't a lot of money in anything. And so then when I went to Syracuse, uh, I uh, played lacrosse there, I ran track, and I played football. And uh, I always remember my lacrosse because it was the epitome of, of a team. We all had our skills. Our goalie was an Onondaga chief, Chief Horn Lions. And the history of the game is fascinating because it's an Indian game created by Native Americans. And they played box lacrosse, et cetera, et cetera. And then my midfield was an All-American. Then he became coach and won six national championships. Now his son is coaching. So we have all of those memories. And then we used to be so good in our senior year, we'd play a half, and then he'd let us go get dressed. You know? <laughs> and then we used to go to, to uh, games in, in around Cornell and Colgate and those schools close by in our convertible cars. So the experience of lacrosse was one of loving sports and loving sportsmanship and teamwork. And now the opportunity with the Lizards, when that came along, it was just a dream for me because uh, here I am right back with the cross, and it is the fastest growing sport in America at this time. We have time yes. for one more question. Back. Um, thank you all for your really inspirational um, discussions here tonight. I mean, it really is inspirational. But th my question is actually to David Brushes. Um, Given the romance and the, you know, how icon, how, what an icon Everest is, it's become very commercial in the last few years. So it means that more and more people have access to this dream. But do you think, do you think it's been irrevocably changed? 
It's a what? Sorry. The art of climbing and what that meant within cultures. So Everest now is so much more commercialized and we've had a bad year this year. Do you think it's been irrevocably changed away from the sort of nobility and the beauty of what it once was? Yeah, climbing on Everest has changed uh, a lot since I first climbed the mountain myself in 1983. I was the 135th person to climb Everest. Now um, that took 30 years from the first ascent in May 29th, 1953 with Hillary and Tenzing. Now 135 people climb the mountain in a day. Somewhere around 5,800, 5,900 people have climbed the mountain. I was um, at base camp this year with the world's highest photo exhibit for Glacier Works, um, bringing attention to our project. And there were 750 people arrayed on the glacier, 20 or 30 teams. There was, um, when we were there in 1983, we were one team. We set the route ourselves. Uh, we were what we would call mountaineers. Um, we grew up with a certain idea of craft and mentorship and apprenticeship and we brought skills and experience to the mountain. That was just part and parcel of climbing Everest in that era. I really, I really understand why someone wants to stand on top of that mountain and I understand people wanting to act out whether it's uh, a dream, uh, a feather in your cap, um, bragging rights, wh whatever it is. I, 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 don't under I can't understand someone's intent, only they can. But when you see people who are essentially learning basic ice climbing at the base of the mountain, you, you ask yourself, what is in this experience? Um, is it just to get to the top by any means, hand-led, hand-fed, lots of bottled oxygen, the, sometimes the skill level, and I really don't want to speak disparaging about the clients, we call them clients, we don't call them mountaineers or alpinists. Um, they're decent people. I'm not sure that they know what they're getting into, but it's just such an extraordinary thing for me to think mm -hmm. that standing on top of a mountain fundamentally was about skill, competence, experience, self-reliance in small teams. And when you see this tremendous ambition, and I think this is a problem we see in a lot of areas in contemporary life, people really want something. But when ambition is not matched by experience, it's a very dangerous thing. And when that, because if you are ambitious, and it's a good thing to be ambitious and have goals, Without putting that heavy lifting into getting good enough to do something with a high level of skill to reduce the risk and feel that tr tremendous sense of reward of bringing all that to stand on top, then it's an activity on a mountain that I really don't understand anymore. It's, it's something different and it will continue to grow and it will continue uh, to grow in the way it has grown. 11 people died this year, but the thing is, you come back with bragging rights, uh, whether you earn them or not, whether the Sherpas carried every load up that mountain, whether you never chipped one piece of ice off that glacier and melted it for your water and poured it into a pot and cooked your food at 26,000 feet, that's earning the summit. When you come back and say you've stood on the top of Everest, Nobody says, how did you do it? They say, wow, you did something hard. Yeah. It ain't getting to the top, folks, right? It's how you got there. Thank you. Yeah. Good deal, man. Mm -hmm. Nice bet. Thank you very much. Michelle, Jim, David, uh, thank you very much. I, I think what all of us should leave here recognizing is that we're all richer for what you have shared with us today. And what you have done today isn't easy because what you have done is talk very personally about your lives, what's important, and I know we've all benefited from it. So I thank you very much and I would encourage everyone as you walk out the door, if you turn to the right, U.S. Trust has a pavilion 
um, and uh, we would encourage anyone who's interested to stop by. Panelists, thank you, and thank you for thank being you a great audience. Much.